Welcome to the HU Movemakers Podcast, where we highlight folks that are blazing the trail and making moves in Howard culture. Hello and welcome to the HU Movemaker Podcast, where we highlight folks in Howard culture that are trendsetters and movemakers. Today, we got a special guest in the building. This young lady deals with the power of story. She says she always had a story, but she wasn't the one writing it. I want to I wanna learn about that. Educator turned entrepreneur, businesswoman, CEO of Birthright Consulting, founder of Educator's Promise, man, author of Jewels from a Black Diamond. Wow. Talks about self-discovery, struggles with confidence, author of No Saving Me For Later. I mean, we got to get into all of these books. Putting your focus back on you and making the steps to, to live your best life. She got a degree from Howard and the other H from Harvard. Welcome Tiffany Stewart, author, founder, CEO, president, entrepreneur, black, brilliant, bougie Howard girl. What's up? <laughs> What's up? I swear when you were talking for a minute, I was like, I, you know, I like all how old that sounds. So yeah, man. I was yeah. bad. So you said before you was a writer, um, you had a story, but you wasn't the one telling it. Uh, what's, where they do that at? What's that mean? Listen, so, you know, I would say like the most impactful story that like thing about my story is really understanding how valuable I am. And like, honestly, I feel like that is my like life's purpose. Like one of my life's purpose is to help other people understand their own value. Sometimes it could look like people have value, right? So I went to Howard, I went to Harvard, you know, I was running businesses. So like on the outside, people could feel like, oh, she's doing it. She's doing everything she wants to do. She has this, she has that, she's going on trips. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you value yourself. And for a long time, for a really, really long time, I was being a people pleaser. I was doing whatever I thought people thought I should do. I was building other people up, not building myself up. I was in relationships that were not bi-directional. So like I was doing a lot of giving to what people needed, but not receiving what I needed, just taking what they were willing to give. And I lived my life like that for a long time. Like if somebody attributed something to me, I would be like, oh, I guess that's what I am. So let me try to fix that and do that. And like, it's not something that happened drastically. It's not something that people knew right away, but it was like very subtle, like a subtle drift to that. And nobody really knew only if you were really close to me or if you knew me before. So I spent a long time like that, a really, really long time. And honestly, it took this year to really be like, nah, I'm not doing that anymore. And I'm gonna take my pen because it's my gift. And I'm going to write my own story, call my own shots. I'm not going to accept less than what I deserve in no arena of my life, whether it's business, personal relationships, anything. And I'm going to do and make decisions that are best and healthy for me. Mm. So. so here we are. <laughs> so here we are, man. So that uh, that's interesting. So, I mean, I look at you, you. You're a pretty woman, you're a smart woman, accomplished woman. You say you travel. I mean, what, like, I, I don't, I'm, what happened? How did you lose yourself? Like, what was going on here? Can you give me some actual examples of how your voice was not being heard despite all of this success? Because I, I don't see it. I see, I see brilliance. I see black. I see a Howard woman. What's, what's up? Oh, yeah. Now, like today. Yeah, that's that's definitely what you see. Um, and that's what it is. But beforehand. Um, really, for me, like how it played out and for some people it could play out differently, but for me, how it played out was relationships. Mm -hmm. So like intimate ones and, and like specifically. So in relationships, when I say like that are not. Yeah, let's start there. Tell me. Tell me about this. Like, tell me about a toxic relationship. And or maybe that you weren't in, but mm -hmm. somebody that you know was in. Can you give me an example of, of how a toxic relationship can have you questioning 
how dope you are. Yeah, well, I'm gonna tell you about the one. I'm gonna talk about me because you know. Okay. It, I feel like that's the most authentic way to explain it. Um, and it, and when I do talk about it, like I never present it in a way to bash anyone because I do understand, like having done my own healing work, that the person who I was involved with was hurt in some way, experienced trauma in some way, and needs to do theirs. So doesn't justify the actions of it. But what I do now have is a level of understanding so that. I know I wouldn't involve myself in a situation like that anymore. Mm -hmm. But when I say that is you can have all of these things. See, people think value comes from like your accomplishments or your money or how you look. And like, while those things are reflective of how you value yourself, for sure, it's not where you should place your value. Because even with those things, if you don't understand how valuable you are, valuable you are just innately as a person, like, I, you know, I believe in God. So God created me. I must be valuable. Mm -hmm. I must have purpose. If I was created in his image, then there must be some big plan for me. And even though I knew that, I didn't know that in my heart. I understood that intellectually. So in relationships, there's certain things that like you might compromise and do. And to some extent, it's good, but not to your own demise. So for example, you know, when I'm with someone, like I really like love them, like whatever it is that I can do, like I'm going to do go all out and do. But some people will only choose to love you how they want to love you. Mm -hmm. And some people will only love you with conditions. So like in my situation, you know, it was like I, I and how I felt about it was I will love you. I love you for what you could do for me. I love you for like what I think we could build together and like we could have. What you know, like what the things I came with degrees, the, the way I look, certain things like that, not necessarily for who I was as a person, like for me before degrees, without degrees, not even considering degrees or anything else. That was like the missing piece. Mm -hmm. And you're in a place like that, it doesn't happen all, you know, it doesn't happen like drastically or it didn't happen drastically for me. It was just like, oh, you know, everything's happy, everything's good, we're doing things. And then one day, it might be like a, a verbal abuse. Oh, that's stupid. Now it's your stupid. You know, like, and then after a while. Wow. So. Yeah. So it's like a little subtle, like, oh, that's dumb. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then it's like kind of putting a filler out there. Next thing you know, it's like, you're dumb. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that's not, that's not cool. Mm -hmm. So what, I mean, so when something like that was, was happening, I mean, what, what would your response be? Like, you would just kind of ignore it? yeah like you know because when it first happens it's always apologetic so it's like oh that's not how I meant it or I was upset and like those little those little things um people you know like you're like okay I can understand that I love this person I think they love me mm -hmm. they were upset. but depending on how you reacted to it and then what happens next is like open door for I'll do it again and then you thinking oh I invested so much time with this person and like maybe they'll change or like you know maybe something different will take place but before you know it you don't lost yourself welcome to the go fish village podcast as a chinese proverb says give a man a fish and you feed him for a day teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime at go fish our goal is to teach individuals just like you how to build wealth through real estate you lost yourself and that's so at what point do you lose yourself because i mean if you're in a relationship with somebody I mean, it's me being a devil's advocate. Even mm -hmm. if you're in a relationship with somebody and they say that's dumb, like, is that abuse? You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. sometimes that's just how you talk. You know, at what point is it like, all right, you're doing too much with that, you know? Yeah, well, you know, I think it's different for everybody. Like, I, I, I certainly, like, for my case, I don't think it started with, with that person you know mm -hmm. like I think like you know like depending on like your, your background and your history and like just how you process things I think that could happen too but what I will say is like a lot of times you know like if you're thinking about how you're treating people then like certain things you just will and won't you know like it's you even in your like I mean ask you like if there's certain people you just know you're not gonna say nothing crazy to mm -hmm. and it's certain people that you could and you'd be like you know, you know, nothing's really going to happen. And so I learned over the years, you teach people how to treat you. Yeah. Not necessarily that the person was wrong for how they treated me, but like I allowed the environment. And so like, that's uh, yeah. what my book is about. It's like, mm -hmm. it's not like bash this person. It's like, yo, whatever toxic or crazy situation you're in, you're a part of it. Mm -hmm. And you have to make, forget that person for a second. You have to make the changes 
that you need to make for yourself in order to remove yourself from that situation. Stop focusing on like the blaming, the complaining of the person. Like you're a part of it too. Even if you're um, a passive player, you're still a part of it. Yeah, I've always yeah. wondered how people could get, because it's like from the outside looking in, you're like, yo, I never, I would never let somebody do that to me. And I've had people, I've talked to people and they, they said the same thing. And then they said, damn, next thing they know, they was in that situation. It's <laughs> true. Mm-hmm. It's true. So what, so now are you saying that, that you're wiser and you wouldn't let that happen? Like, like how would you respond in that situation now that you've been able to kind of put pen to paper and invent and learn from those, those traps? Yeah. Like I, um, I mean, now, yeah, absolutely. Like, I understand my value. The The issue was I didn't understand my value to begin with. So that's how something like that could, that could happen. It's like, you don't really know how dope you are. When I wrote the book, um, it was so funny because, like, I love the title, No Saving Me For Later, because it sounds like I'm being slick. But really, I'm talking about, I'm talking about to me, like, to myself. Like, I'm not going to save me for later anymore. So the whole book is about, like, your, your worth, your identity, your value, your purpose, and really about you can't control what someone else does. You can only control your response to it and, like, what you tolerate. Mm-hmm. So now, yeah, definitely, I would... You know, I feel like I wouldn't put myself in an unhealthy relationship again. Um, But what I do know from writing the book is the amount of people who are in unhealthy relationships or in situations that like don't they really don't speak about. They only show the good stuff like on the gram or on social media. Like it's crazy. Like people really are in unhealthy situations, Um, either the perpetrators of it or people who are, you know, suffering from it. And it's it's almost become a norm, like the excessive cheating or lying or, you know, like just all these different things. That it's like, why are we doing that? And why as a society are we OK with treating people like that? What, what are some of the effects of being in an unhealthy relationship? For starters, you get you low self-confidence, your confidence drop. So anything that you are, are supposed to do, you know what I mean? How, how are you going to do it with low confidence? Who's going to want to listen to you with low confidence? How you gonna be a boss with low confidence? How you gonna move and shake and impact? Cause that's why I feel like purpose does. It's supposed to impact other people. How are you gonna do that with low confidence? You really can't. So are these are these things that happen like like are like are, are these things that happen at childhood for you and you enter these toxic relationships, or is it like you're going along, you're going along about your married life, you achieving, and then you just meet a toxic person and they bring you down? I think it could be both. I don't, you know, like, I definitely think it could be both. It just really depends. Um, I think what it really is, is that people don't really, people have different definitions of love. People have different definitions of respect. Um, People have different ways of upbringing. So like how love is shown and how love is displayed and how respect is displayed, all those different things, like they're just different for different people. And these are not conversations or they may not be conversations that people have often enough to really have like a baseline of like understanding between people. I see. I see. So, so you talk about, um, you know, putting the focus on yourself. Uh, how, how do you put focus on yourself without being too selfish or, or alienating other people? Um, what was too selfish? I don't know. I mean, you know, you, I think a bad trait is being self-centered. You know, mm-hmm. I think every relationship should be about a win-win. You know what I mean? Uh, do you you disagree? No, I definitely don't. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you're an entrepreneur, you're a businesswoman, you know, you know, you got to compromise in relationships. I'm not saying compromise your core values, but, you know. Um, no, but seriously, though, when I, when I say put the focus on myself, I also mean like the spotlight, like, so the things that I need to address and fix and concern, not just like- Give me some examples. Give me some examples. Like for instance, like procrastination. Uh Put focus on myself is like, nah, like I'm aware that I procrastinate. I'm going to make an action plan to fix, to address some of those things. I'm going to execute. So that way that my procrastination doesn't slow up, you know, the things that I have to do. So the focus is not just like on the good things. The focus is on like me, like, you know, good and bad. And really having a progressive, healthy attitude toward addressing all of these things. Hmm. 
So how did you, you know, people are sometimes stuck in situations that might be toxic. How, how do you, number one, how do you first recognize it? And then how do you get out of it? That's a good question. That is a good question. And in my experience. <laughs> that's all I do is ask good questions on here, baby. That's, that's it. I, mean, I, I, don't, guess, I don't know nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question. Um, Goodness. I know how I got, like, I know what happened for me. Like, it's my belief, like, that really it was only by God's grace. In all seriousness and, like, all sincerity, honestly, that was how I was able to lift myself up and get out of it. And then not only get out of it, but walk away from everything that I once had, which was a lot to walk away from, and then build my own thing and have more way more than I had in the beginning. Like that takes a, like that's faith. That's a lot. I don't know. I, you know, like I'm not like a mental health professional. I don't know in like the real, like scientific terms as to how you can do it. But I'm gonna share my experience because I know it will help someone. Yeah. I know that it was like really building a relationship with God and really understanding who I was. And my identity in relation to that, that really helped me to say, wait, like I, this hurts and this is a lot to deal with, but this is probably not the best thing for me. And I need to figure out how to have something better. But um, it also was, it, was this a, a, a physically abusive situation that you were in? Or was no, it, it wasn't physically abusive. No, it was emotionally abusive. So was it, I mean, was it people that were telling you like, yo, Tiff, you need to get out of this? Or was it like, was it you? Or were you portraying to the outside world that things were all good? I definitely was portraying that things were all good. Man, this this person is bad. Let's say their name. Who, who no, and it's definitely not a good person. <laughs> Let's air them out, man. Who is this person? I, I I definitely wouldn't say they're a bad person. I think again, like when you think about people who hurt, it's come from a hurt place. So in the same way, and that's hurt hurt people, hurt people. I heard that exactly, before. Exactly, exactly. So I would not bad a hurt person and a person who does not know how to articulate their expression of love in a way that could be received by another person, at least not and not in our environment. And and that's one of the like the biggest things for me is like I, like I don't want to perpetuate, and I definitely don't want to be a spectator to that perpetuate cycles of abuse whether it's physical abuse emotional abuse mental like whatever it is like and it doesn't even have to be, always be an intimate dynamic it could be a friendship because some friendships like platonic ones are abusive mm. speak on that what you mean like if you have a friend like for, for instance like i like during this journey i developed like people don't have standards sometimes right so you just enter a relationship with people and you don't have to- <laughs> wait, wait 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 what you say <laughs> people don't have st- what are you what are you talking about what do you I'm mean they don't about, have standards <laughs> i'm talking about the things that you hold yourself up to like so for instance i'll give you an example like one of my standards is accountability right so i'm i'm gonna hold myself accountable and if i'm in relationship with other people i'm gonna be accountable and I'm expect that they are they are kind of they are accountable for themselves, right? But people don't really think about that. Like you just like, oh, this person's dope. Their vibe is good. So relationship. And that's cool. That's okay. But like in that process, at some point, you should have like some type of standard or a boundary that says that if they do X, Y, and Z, I'm gonna have to back up a little bit. Yeah, okay. Or if I see red flags, I'm gonna have to take notice because sometimes what we do is ignore the red flags. Can they know those flags? Can't even know that flies. You can't know those signs because it's only going to get worse. Exactly. Man, so, so you got to put yourself first because if you don't love you, ain't nobody else going to love you. You know what right. I mean? But you, you know, a lot of people don't know they don't love themselves for real, for real. Like they, they love themselves like showing it mm-hmm. like on display for other people. But like what healthy choices are you making in your day-to-day life that really prove and convey the message that you love yourself? So what what made you want to put all of this positivity on social media and in reality is different? Why why do people do that? I don't know why people do that. I really don't know why people <laughs> cat on social media and make it seem one way and it's really not. Um, but people just like to be liked. They like the likes. They like the comments. I I you know I suppose that's why anybody does it. But is um, that is that is that um. 
therapeutic or is that um does that help people cope you know just based on your research or in writing your book like did that ever come across your mind like why am i you know because it's you know at the same time why would you why would somebody put negative stuff on yeah. on social media it's true i think um I wouldn't say, I don't know if people are doing it purposely every time to present. I think a lot of people are. I also think people's thinking is distorted. So like you might not necessarily see something for what it really is. A lot of people are seeing things for what they want it to be. Whether that's a relationship, whether that is themselves, people are seeing things for what they want it to be and not necessarily for what it really truly is. Hmm. So maybe that's why people go on social media and like present one thing or, you know, and it's the opposite. So, so what, so what are things that I can control? You know, cause I think people, you know, anxiety creeps up on everybody, whether, you know, you're making a million dollars or you broke or you yes. look great or you don't. Um, I think everybody at one phase, at one time of life, at one time in their life, you know, has issues with anxiety. I would imagine. Um, how do you focus on things that you control and block out the, the things you can't? Yeah. Um, I think that you have to be very principle heavy. Like there's so many different things that happen in the world, so many different distractions, so many different things that come up. But if you are like solid in who you are, like your principles, your morals, like what you just, your core who you are as a person, then it will help your beliefs. Like it will help with some of that anxiety or some of those pressures or some of those things that come up that really come, I feel like to delay you or detour you from whatever it is just really supposed to be doing in this earth. And like, for me, like how I frame it now and how I understand it is, it's like, I really have a purpose. I truly 100% wholeheartedly believe that I have a purpose on this earth. Mm. And that affects how I move. That affects my decision making. That affects my thinking. Perks. That affects my conversation. The things that come out of my mouth. That affects how I interact with people. That affects how I show love and how I care for others. That affects who I choose to have in my circle. That affects, you know, how what I choose to put on social media or what I choose to do or what my business is. So it's really understanding that you have a purpose. And if you're lucky enough to um find out what your purpose is or know your purpose then you will know that it's bigger than you it's not just something for you for your life it's bigger than you because purpose always comes with impact impact and purpose are always connected so whatever it is that you're supposed to be doing is going to impact the lives in like a really meaningful and intentional way of other people purpose i like that and that was a great i'm glad you brought that up how do you how do you find your purpose because for so many people um in life i mean people we're going through the motions and then sometimes going through the motions you can find yourself in a situation that you never wanted to be in if you're not intentional about you know the things that you want out of life how do, how do you find purpose goodness why you you and these big questions you have these big questions I like them but they're like <laughs> hard to answer but how do you find purpose um hmm, that's a great question I'm, I have to tell you I don't know how well how did you how did you find your purpose my purpose mm -hmm. I'm telling you and building a really meaningful relationship with God and understanding who I was and understanding like what my gift was, what I'm supposed to do on the earth, that is how I found my purpose. That is what led me on the road to purpose. And I heard someone speak the other day, um, like on a live, mm -hmm. and he said something to me that was so profound, so I'm gonna repeat it. He said something like, when you find your purpose, Sometimes there's like this conception or this misconception of it that like it's all cloud nine, like everything is going great. You're doing this, you're doing that. And he said, but sometimes a lot of times when you find your purpose or when you begin to walk in your purpose, everything goes wrong. Everything that you could think of goes wrong because 
there's everything like, and you know, if you if you're a spiritual person, then you I would call it the enemy. But like, we'll want you to stay away from that purpose. We'll want you to be distracted from that purpose, to be delayed from that purpose, to not necessarily um, walk into that purpose because of the impact that comes with purpose. Because like, there's something that is so big that comes with purpose that it can't be stopped. Um, so everything is going to try to go against you to stop the purpose. And I never thought about purpose that way. But what I will say is that when it came to me and I found my purpose and I started to walk in my purpose, that is what happened. I did experience like a lot of different things that really did try to um, hold me back from walking into this purpose. And it could have had I not been grounded. And I really do believe, again, like it was because of like God's grace that I was able to like keep going. So mm. I see one of your quotes, you say, when, when you truly value yourself, you don't settle for pieces. What does that yeah. mean? So there's a part of my book um, where I talk about um, eating crumbs and calling it cake. And basically... Mm. Eating crumbs and calling the cake. Calling the cake. But how many people, I mean, be honest, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people have done it or currently are. So what I mean is, and this can be in any context, again, like my, the catalyst for my change in my life came from a relationship, but it could be with a job. It don't have to be a relationship. But what I mean is, you know how like you have this idea of what you want mm -hmm. and go into, let's say a relationship, you go into a relationship, this is what I want. And this person's like, ah, I like you, but I don't really want that. Mm -hmm. So you start adjusting your values and what you want. And then you convince yourself that you were really cool with what you adjusted to from the beginning. No good, huh? It's no good. It's no good. And that's what eating crumbs and calling it cake is. It's like, and then you just start to like embrace this thing that you can't even really want because you convince yourself that, well, I guess this is what I can settle for. And this is what I could really get. That's so, what it is. so tell me, you know, Jewels from a Black Diamond, if I was to read this book, what, what can a person expect to uh, receive and, and learn? Okay. So Jewels from a Black Diamond, this book is like, it was my first book. It wasn't really, I didn't know necessarily I was going to publish it or release it. It was really just a cathartic thing for me to be able to like process my emotions. So it's like, it's just a raw, untainted, unfiltered, probably got some typos in it, maybe, but you wouldn't catch it because it's poetry. Um, <laughs> it is just like me on a page and I'm just talking about like all the different things that I'm feeling. So it's a collect, it's a collection of poetry. And it's also like affirmations and like just me, like prose, like just me talking about certain things that are happening in my life at the time. How how important are um, affirmations? And oh my are, goodness. And what are they? Like what's the sum that you live by? Oh my goodness. So affirmations, um, I feel like everybody should have some affirmations, like repeat some daily or as often as you can, um, just to reaffirm what it is that you already know, um, because the world we live in is crazy. And like, it's just so many different things that come to distract. But like some of my favorite affirmations is like, I am valuable. Mm -hmm. You know, like I am worthy. I am beautiful. Like you'd be surprised, like beautiful women who don't even recognize their own beauty. Um, because of like all the things that they might be bombarded with and it and people don't I know what I'm talking about might sound like there's not really what people are struggling with or not really on people's minds but you'd be really surprised at how many people are struggling like look the part right like look like everything but really are struggling with confidence and like they're you know like how why, really why is that like how can somebody on the outside look like they have it all but on the inside not you know have suffer from low self-esteem how does that even happen because it's as a society it's easy for because of what's like perpetuated it's easy for us to even unconsciously i believe place value in like the outside of things like what it looks like so like material things your bank account which you can't afford to buy um where you live what vacation you can go on you know, it's easy to think somebody is doing so well based on these things mm -hmm. that they feeling. And if your value is becomes based in these things, then what happens if you lose it? 
that means you're not valuable anymore. Mm, that's a bar. So, right. So that's why I like I keep saying, but because we see it all the time and because it's like perpetuated, it's the thing that you know we all kind of be like, oh, that person must be X, Y, Z because they have this or this picture looks like this, that looks like that. But in reality, this person could be hurting. This person could be depressed. This person could be really struggling mentally with like so many different things but it's not what they're going to put out it's not what they're going to show and it don't mean that they even think they're valuable they just might happen to have things that make them look valuable to other people mm. that's that's real so what what um are, are there any personal stories that you can tell uh tell or share uh from uh jewels from a black diamond or any life lessons that you can share um let me see. I'm just gonna open it up real quick and see. Did you write the book or? or? Yeah, I wrote <laughs> it. <laughs> um, I would say. Cause you talked about it, you know, the reflections of struggling with with confidence. Yeah, um, like I. That's you know, I want to I want to make sure I leave a lasting impression. Um. Are there anything specific in there? There's a lot of specific things in there. <laughs> There's a lot of specific things in there. Um, but I guess I would say, like, the one that resonates the most to me um, and the one that I just, like, it was actually, like, the first poem I ever I ever wrote in my life. It's called Black Woman. And it just talks about the beauty of a black woman um, inside and out. And despite any type of challenges, despite anything that's going on in the outside world, despite anything that she may encounter, um, mm -hmm. this is what I wanna say, one that like love itself starts from within, the love that a black woman deserves, it starts from herself. And then two, like no matter who comes to try to tarnish your name or dim your light, like as a black woman your light cannot be then it can't be so like I guess I would say like just to leave to encourage somebody who might be going through something who you know might not know how to handle some of the obstacles that's coming their way just know that what um is so is this book is for for men or for it's for women I take it yeah so this particular book Juice for Black Diamond is you know, like more women would be able to relate to it than men. However, though, um, if you like poetry and if you can appreciate art, then like I have had men say like, this book is dope. It's a, it's a good book. Do you find that uh, the more men or more women struggle with uh, these insecurity issues? I say both. Both? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they play out differently. I think they definitely play out differently, but... I see it both. I see both ways. What What did you learn about yourself uh, once you were done? What What impact did it have on you? Goodness, I mean, um, <laughs> went like literally. You talking about from Jewels from a Black Diamond or the No Saving Me for Later? Because those the uh, Jewels from a Black Diamond. When Jewels from a Black Diamond is when I realized I had a gift, and I knew what it was after that. That is when I realized, oh, I can write. And like, not only can I write, because you know, some people are good at stuff. Don't mean it's your gift. Like, no, that's my gift. That's mm. like what I'm supposed to be doing in this world is writing. That's when I realized that. Okay. Mm. Okay. That's dope. So, and then no saving me for later. Um, Were you in a relationship and you were like, like, did somebody say that to you? Like, did they put you on a back burner and you're like, ah, oh, book idea. Like, how did this, how did that one come about? <laughs> <laughs> so no saving me I, when I wrote the no saving me for later I was not in a relationship um but the what was the situation that inspired that yeah but what inspired, inspired it yeah. was I had like yeah I had just well not just but like maybe some months prior to I had broken up with um my boyfriend at the time and we were in a relationship for you know a long time a, a good length of time and we had like different things together and I found myself like back, like in my mother's house, sleeping on her couch. Mm. And I was just thinking to myself, like, how did I get here? 
Like, you know, like I was really thinking to myself, like what choices, like how did I end up crying on my mother's couch now living on my mother's couch after, you know, like that wasn't in my life before that. And wow. I, it, it wasn't in my plan. So, so, that, so how did you get out of that? How long were you with your, your ex? Um, we were together for like six years. Six years. So you were, that's love, right? Or, yeah. or did you think it was love? Was it love? Or yeah, was I, definitely, it? I definitely thought it was love, for sure. But it wasn't love. It wasn't love. I mean, not by God's standard of love. Not by God's definition of love. It wasn't. So what so. What would you call it? Because, you know, it's, it's somebody watching this who needs to hear your story. Oh, and, they yeah. need, and they need to know not to go down that same rabbit hole. Because that's six years, six good years of your life. You know what I'm talking about? We not, you know, we don't want to make these mistakes. I mean, sometimes you got to make mistakes to uh, move forward in life. But if we can avoid them, you know, that's even better. Yeah. You know, my father used to say um, stupid people don't learn from their mistakes. Smart people learn from their mistakes and wise people learn from other people's mistakes. So, praise, yeah, like praise, I praise. That's a whole that's a whole, put that on a shirt. That needs to go on a shirt. <laughs> I definitely wrote it so people could understand. Like, you don't have to do the same thing that I did. But what I will say is, yeah, I wrote it like that. Like I wrote it on my mother's couch. I wrote it. So how how like, did you I know that relationship wasn't for you? To like, be honest, when I ended it, I didn't really know until like after I wrote the book. Then I'm like, yeah, you know, like. After you wrote the book. So what, what made the- you end the relationship? Um. I'm digging here. I'm digging. Come on. Help you me are out. digging, but it's okay. Um, it, it just wasn't, it wasn't going in the direction that I wanted to go in. And it also <laughs> wasn't. It, it also wasn't going in the direction. Well, we well, we know that, but uh, what like what happened? What was the aha moment? What was because sometimes we can be in these relationships and you know, because you've been with a person so long, you just keep it yeah. going and you ignore signs. Next 10 years later, three babies later, you still with the person, you know, um, but people just don't have the strength to oh, yeah. tell somebody or even they might even have the strength to say it, but then they don't have the strength to act on it. They keep saying it. They keep saying it. And, you know, they keep getting in debt together. They keep mm-hmm. doing, doing stuff, you know, Tiff, help me out. How do we help these people? What did you do? What did you do, Tiff? What did you say? Give me step by step. What's the playbook? Okay. (laughs) Let me give you step by step. So when I realized it wasn't working for real is when I, when I knew that I had not been valued in relationship. And that could look different, but like, whatever it is, like, I don't care if it's be like, this is not my situation, but like, if if it's you being lied to, if it's someone calling you names, if it's someone talking to you crazy, if they even not calling you names, but they don't talk to you with respect. Whatever it is that you expect that's reasonable, because I don't, because some people get crazy with it, but like, I'm talking about like baseline, border, like just baseline stuff. If you're not, if you're being disrespected, a person doesn't value you. You can see how, what a person values by how they treat it. Mm-hmm. Period. So once I realized that I wasn't being valued, I said, okay, I'm taking a step back. Once I, and I, it, and not even once I realized it, once I realized it to the point where I couldn't ignore it anymore, because I realized it before that. Mm. Right. But I so said, what did you tell them? Were you telling them like, yo, I, like, man, yeah, you're was, not, you're not respecting me. You're not respecting me. You're not hearing me. Like, was it arguing that was going on? Yeah. Like exactly. I, I, I would say, you know, like I would express myself mm-hmm. and after a, so long of a situation, couldn't take it anymore yeah like changing you you might just have to like do something different it can't be the same so if you knew that that was good to get out of that situation why were you still like sick like why were you still going through like why was you on your mom's couch after you got that monkey off your back well one is like financially all our stuff was together right so oh that's so that's that's strike one so we we can't we can't do that we can't do that Okay, okay, keep going, keep going. Now we're getting somewhere. Yep, yeah, you definitely, you should you should definitely think about the contracts, the agreements you go into um, before you go into them. So that was one thing. Um, and two is like, just because you realize that something is not right or like something is wrong with the situation doesn't mean that like you don't still want it, right? So it's like that's- like a drug. That, exactly. It's like exactly. a drug, wow. 
you don't especially like love if you think you're in love with somebody and you really want something to work out you want that hmm. that's what you want so you will try to adjust or maneuver or compromise and even if you did have to walk away you doesn't mean you still don't you don't care for that person or you don't miss them or you don't want things to work out eventually so you have all that stuff going on. So that's why I was on my mother's couch crying and living on my mother's couch crying. And and when I looked at the situation, right, this is the most important piece. And this is a, the reason why I wrote the book. When I looked at it, I could like go on and on and on for days about what he did, how he did, what he said, what he, how, you know, what he texted me, all this different stuff. But like when I think about it, I'm like, yo, I really, I really, I really, I, allow this to happen I really and like that's when I was like yo it's not it's no saving me for later like why did I do that why did I make decision after decision that was like not smart why did I do that why as a smart and a woman with two degrees from two of the best schools that people could only hope to go to why did I do that mm, so why why did you and it was because in real life, I didn't have a true sense of how valuable I was. Mm. Wow. That is the only reason so why do you do you do you understand your value now or are you still Oh, I definitely do. Okay. Yeah, for sure. So are you in a relationship now? No, I'm not. Okay. Okay. Any prospects? Yeah. You know, I'm just I'm I'm you I'm might too be too I valuable now. You're too <laughs> val you got too much value. <laughs> No, I'm working on me. I'm working on like all the stuff that I missed, you know, trying to like do something that something else. I'm working on me. I'm working on building an empire, building multi-million dollar businesses. So mm. I got to do it. So what about what, what are your thoughts on uh, Kevin Samuels? Do you know him? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. hey, give me the breakdown. <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? Cause... Goodness. Um. Well, what I will say is I love an honest person. You know, I think that his honesty is a plus. Uh, when it comes to, I don't know. I just want to know like who made him the spokesperson for like what people want. Um, well, he got you know, a lot of followers. Like, he got he does, a lot of followers, and uh, I mean. It, doesn't mean he shouldn't be. I, I'm just asking. I mean, does, does, does anything you say, does it make sense to you? Or do you think it's off base? I, I do think some of the stuff that he says makes sense. I think that it's the way that he says it that makes it oh, offensive yeah. or entertainment for people. So, which if, is if, like so in your situation that you was going through, if you would have come into contact with him and he was to say, yo, you know, do, do you think that that would have helped help you through those situations or would it have further, you know, added more problems to what you were going? No, through? I mean, no, I, I don't no, I don't I don't want that advice because what I would ask. If I'm <laughs> you, say you don't want that advice. <laughs> oh, want man. That advice. But when I'm looking at the situation, right, because what he some of the stuff that he says is like realistic. I get it. But when I'm looking at it, I'm really asking, like, why is this woman set on getting this thing? like we people are really I get it you want to live a good life you want things you want to go places you don't want to be in debt you don't want to be broke in poverty I understand that but like as a woman I'm just thinking to myself like why is my like life goal or like one of my biggest life goal is to get a man that has this and not to get a man a good man that actually loves and cares for me Wow. Like, like, how come? So why don't want women think like that? Why do they want the man that got to have six figures? You got to be this tall. You got to do this, this and that versus the man that just is going to be loyal, going to be there for you. It's going to hold you high. He may not be making six figures, but hey, he's going to work every day. You know why? Why? Where does that come from? I think it's a misplaced or displaced, misplaced, displaced. One of them. Is your value is not in the right place. I'll say that. Your value is not in the right place because your value is emphasized or emphasis on things. Hmm. Things. Why? Like that's the you know that's the real question. Why are is your value on things and not on like people or 
relationships or connections. Like, I don't, I don't, like, I would like a, you know, of course anybody would want a partner who has a lot of money, okay? But like, I would be, that's like a plus. I really want a man that treats me right. Mm-hmm. And it's just a, a good, you know, like a good man. Like the the other stuff is a plus. Money is a plus. Money is easy. That's what people don't, that's what people fail to realize. Like money is easy. What it's you like money is easy. Like people, some people <laughs> their whole life, biggest goal is to get money. I, I get it, I understand that because I'm definitely a believer in wealth creation. Like I want to create wealth, generational wealth. So I understand that. But it's not the end or be all because you see people all the time with money is who are still unhappy well yeah people don't know how to keep money they you know they want to they think they want money they just want to spend money <laughs> <You know? laughs> maybe maybe that they but wind up being broke you know what i mean uh what about when he says stuff like hey you know you were, he told the one lady like you're a seven at best you don't deserve a man that's making a hundred thousand you do you agree that I mean, how does that statement land on you or something like that? I think it's crazy that anybody would even put this over in a position for somebody else to tell them what they are, who they are, and what they deserve. Mm-hmm. How? 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 I don't understand that. I don't understand how that. Not even that he's saying it because he has an opinion, right? And he is, he is, he has an opinion that is rightful in his mind. But I can't understand that. I already tell the fact that he. Let me tell you something. He already knows if he's a smart man, he sounds like he's a smart man. He already knows that anybody who comes on that show to get for him to tell them what they are, who they are and what they deserve already has a low value of themselves. Mm. So you can't let other people define what. We cannot let anybody else define. I just that's how we started this interview is letting other people write your story. Now, now you think I'm a seven and you think. I'm this and I deserve this. That's what I'm going to live by. That's crazy. Wow. It's crazy. Wow. Get, get deep. So what, what made you come to Howard? Oh, so first of all, um, I was in, I went to high school in Connecticut. I had never even heard of Howard University, but my math teacher, I remember this so clear. My math teacher, um, her name was Miss Bright. She was like, do you know anything about HBCUs? And I'm like, no, what's that? And so she started explaining to me HBCUs. She started with Howard. And I promise you, from that day, I already knew I was going to Howard. I wasn't going to any other school but Howard. I went home and, like, did research and, like, all types of stuff. Um, And And what what year are you coming to Howard? I came in uh, 2006. Oh, okay. Okay. Came in the 06. What was it like? What was it like when you got there? Did you match, match the expectations when you arrived? I mean, so <laughs> I had never been, um, I lived in Connecticut and I had never been like to DC before. So when we drove down, it was like, oh, wow. Like a whole, like literally a whole new world to me. I'm like, and you know, we went to the, um, the McDonald's across the street on Georgia Avenue. Oh like, yeah, the classic before. McDonald's. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I was like, oh, okay. Ooh, that joint bussing. <laughs> yeah. All those was all those motorcycles over there. The motorcycles, the every the people, everything. It yeah. was like crazy, and I was just like, it was, you know, it was a little overwhelming for me, being I had been in a new place, and I, it was no turning back though. That was the thing I had decided. I had even gotten to other schools, and I was just like, I'm not going. Howard literally was the last school that um that I got my acceptance letter from. Like I called them up and was like, "Did y'all send my stuff out yet, or did I get in?" Because I already knew I was going. So, so what? How would you uh, rate your Howard experience? A ten. A ten. An absolute. You had a good time. Scale, I had a great time. Yes. What were some of the uh, organizations you was involved in at Howard? Um. I was involved in um, LOQ, you know, Ladies of the Quad. Okay. I, yep, I definitely did that. Um, I was an RA and wow. in the end. A boss, mm-hmm. huh? Mm-hmm. You know, Dropping so. dimes on people, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, like I like the thing that I remember most about Howard um, and what I loved the most was <clears throat> seeing like Black people 
like a whole, like just a whole bunch of black people. Like I have roommates that came from like well-to-do families and like, you know, people came from the hood. Like, but it was just so wonderful to just see at like all types of black people in one space. Mm-hmm. And like black doctors, you know, like I went to the, you know, like when I went to the doctor, it was a black doctor. Like that was big. Yeah. Like for me to be able to see something like that. I had <clears> never <throat> had a black doctor before. Wow. Um, mm-hmm. Wow. What what are some of your favorite Howard memories? Mom apps, one of my favorite, it, it might be like the 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 best one for me is I remember one time we I was in the quad, it was my freshman year. And my roommate came and she was like, yo, she was like, Jay-Z is about to be on the yard. And I'm like, you're lying. Mm-hmm. And she's like, no, hurry up, get dressed. It was like in the morning, hurry up, get dressed. We got to go because they only letting a certain amount of people in, inside, like, you know, in space. And I'm like, all right. So I, we get up, we go out there. And he really came and did a like mini concert. And I was just like, yeah, I love it here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, at your door. I mean, that alone is worth uh, price of admission, price of tuition. Man, it was some good times at at Howard. So then, so you go to Harvard too, right? What What did you uh, major in at Harvard? So I have a degree in education from Harvard. Okay. So was that like what? Okay. So you uh like uh, what well, what type of education? I got a master's degree too, but in education, but it ain't from Harvard. So excuse no. me. Education. Oh, excuse me. Elementary education. What'd you get yours in? So I got my it's some it's a program called prevention science and practice. Um basically I didn't do anything um on a, an educator level in terms of being in the classroom. Mm-hmm. More of my stuff came from like assessing needs, um, creating evaluations to like implement better supports for students, mm. uh curriculum design, things like that. Wow, okay. Okay, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So after so how long after Howard did you like what was your first career? Did you go straight to uh to grad school? No, I didn't. I worked for a few years. Um one I worked for a couple years in um like a a home for like uh children who were abused. And then I worked in like substance abuse for for, for a couple years. Women's wow. substance abuse, so helping women who had issues of substance abuse and like we're trying to get their kids back or trying to get like cases overturned and stuff like that. Um, helping them like with some like coping skills and things like that. And then I went um, back to grad school. Okay, so you went to grad school after that. Mm-hmm. So, it, so then, uh, so you go to grad school, you come out, you do your thing in the education space, and then you uh, are you a full time entrepreneur now? Yeah. So, yeah. So basically, like from New York, I um I ended up being a like a school administrator in New York City and then also like an educational consultant. And I worked with like a lot of different um, organizations in New York. And from there, a lot of the funders or people who were like providing funding to the programs that I was in, were like, hey, can you mentor this person? Can you coach this person? Can you like come to this conference? Can you present here? And I'm like, yeah, you know, my career was going great there um and I was like I could do this on my own you know like I could like just do my own thing and so my first business that I started was the one that I had with my um my ex-boyfriend at the time it oh was, oh um, marketing wow. Company. Yeah, wow. yeah so that was my first my the first thing that I ever did um and I was an entrepreneur for three weeks like that business was started in 2017. And then after like we split ways and did our own thing, um, I started my, that's when I realized, and I realized that writing was my passion. That's when I realized, oh, I'm, a, I'm gonna start Birthright Consulting. Um, and so like, I do professional writing for different companies. I nice. Well, Dope. I need to talk to you about that. Welcome to the Go Fish Village podcast. As a Chinese proverb says, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. At Go Fish, our goal is to teach individuals just like you how to build wealth through real estate. A lot, a lot of people say you shouldn't go into business with like a loved one or a family. I mean, is that something? Do you regret going into business with your boyfriend? Um, ooh, regret. Um, no, because at the end of the day, it it led me to where I am today, and like I honestly could not be happier. At the place that I'm in now, my future is certainly bright. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I will say is, yes, like I do think that, like if you're gonna go into business, you know, like that's something that, like, 
I need you got to really think about like is that going to work for you because in a relationship in a part in a business relationship per, personal and business is hard it's hard I definitely I do think it it was the th- one of the things that put the strain on our relationship mm-hmm. so you have to really think about that it's not something that you just go do because it looks cool or it's trendy or whatever you just have to really think about that um I will say like I wouldn't go into business with anyone else like a lover or a partner, unless I was married to them. And even then it would be like, is this something that we really supposed to be doing? Like, right. not just, just because. A hundred percent. I totally, totally get that. And so you, you got a multi-million dollar business right now, right? I'm on track. Multi-million. I'm- okay. On track. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Love it. So what, um, uh, you have a nonprofit too, right? Mm-hmm. Can you tell me a little mm-hmm. bit about that? Yeah, so you know what? And I'm just talking out loud, but maybe you might have, since you're an educator and you said, you know, you have I, a, I a used to be education. an educator. I, I taught for seven years and then um, I, we went on strike in 2012. So I quit teaching and then um, I opened up an insurance agency. So I've been in business for about eight and a half years now. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, you might, you might, I don't know. I, so the educator's promise. I, um, I know for sure. It's gonna be, it's a, I haven't done anything really with this organization. Um, it's just something that I know I want to do. So I imagine it to be a school, but like um, similar to like Teach for America where you would like train people, but the, the core emphasis is on education equity. And it's really about like traditional, but more so non-traditional ways to educate children of color, specifically black children. So like, everything like tailored and customized to them, their needs and like their dreams, goals. So I'm talking about like teaching economics, financial literacy, entrepreneurship, like things that like really break generational poverty, that create generational wealth, that change like the futures and trajectories of students of color, like really that speaks to like the systems um, of oppression that really pervade and are pervasive in all the arenas of the lives of, of young black students mm-hmm. and black people in general. So like, I want something like that's, that is what it is. So it, it, it exists as an organization. Um, and there's been like some movement on like support, but like, I really want this thing to be big. Um, it's just, I'm doing everything by myself. So all my mm. focus is going to like my, you know, my, uh, my corporation, my LLC, which is, um, you know, which makes me the money. But that's my dream. Okay, so so that the nonprofit hasn't uh, started yet. Yeah, it's, it's a it's process. a business. Yeah, yeah, but it hasn't um, it hasn't necessarily like it's not a it's not a huge thing yet. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Dope. Dope. So, what what advice do you have for the eighteen year old uh, Tiffany that's coming to Howard right now? Ooh. Um. I would tell 18 year old Tiffany that's coming to Howard right now that you are in one of the best places to explore your identity, your people, where you came from, your history, like in a rich, cultivated, unfiltered way. You suck all that knowledge up and you apply it to your life. And don't forget that every person um, that you were taught about on that campus, every building you passed that was named for every innovator um, in the field, in their respective fields, like that is you, you are them and don't think you're anything less. Mm. Mm. I love it. I love it. What do you, uh, you know, if if somebody wants to get in touch with you or, or, or follow your movement or support you in some way, copy some of your books, um, how do they do that? One of the best sellers, how do they do that? Yeah, um, my website is um, TiffanyMStewart.com or like my social media, Instagram is TM Stewart. That's like my my writing writing name. So either one of those two. I love it. And what are you, 100 years from now, what are we saying about uh, Tiffany Stewart? What are we saying about Birthright Consulting, The Educator's Promise? What are we, what are we saying? What's the legacy? Who? Um... The legacy is, 
I want people, when I like, when I'm gone in a hundred years, I want people to say, she didn't have anything left in her. Like she gave 100% all of what she had and who she was, period. Mm, I love it. Tiffany Stewart, you've been a great guest on the show. Thanks for thanks for coming on today and dropping these gems. You know, thanks for having me. I hope, you know, I, I hope that whoever is listening um, took something positive from it. That's, you know, that's really what I'm about. Positivity and, um, yeah, light, so. Thank you for joining the HU Movemaker Podcast, where we highlight folks that have contributed to the Howard legacy at the highest levels. To hear more interviews or purchase merchandise, please visit www.humovemakers.com.